and welcome to today's Design News Webinar, Engineering Packaging Machinery That Delivers, Thanks to Advances in Automation and Motion Control. Our webinar today is sponsored by Performance Motion Devices, Harvalux, Encoder Products Company, and Automation Direct, and broadcast by Informa. I'm Daphne Allen, Editor of Design News, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. Our webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout our event. And toward the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problem, please click the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A, and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now, onto the presentation, Engineering Packaging Machinery That Delivers, Thanks to Advances in Automation and Motion Control. Discussing today's topic are Prabhakar Gaurashankaran, Vice President of Engineering and Strategy at Performance Motion Devices, and Kenny Kowalchuk, Sales Engineer at Encoder Products Company. To learn more about our speakers, please visit the bio widget. Now, before we dive into their presentations today, I wanted to take a moment to explore the packaging market and some trends we're seeing. So the U.S. packaging machinery market is huge. According to PMMI's 2021 Packaging Equipment State of the Industry, U.S. packaging machinery shipments totaled $11.2 billion in 2021. The largest category was case handling machinery, followed by filling and labeling machines, according to PMMI. Now, Design News, in general, has been tracking a number of trends. In manufacturing, we are seeing automation continue to ramp up to replace manual labor um, and to drive quality and efficiency improvements and to fill labor shortages, as well as to lengthen production time availability. And these efforts are certainly involving packaging lines, too. This trend includes the growing use of robotics, which also could include multifunction robotics with more coordination, and in some cases could support lights out factories. We are also seeing interest in using vision systems and sensors for increasing visibility and precision on packaging lines and to support advanced processes. We've also been tracking the use of intelligent systems and the industrial internet of things for gathering data, as well as uh, the use of plug-and-play software-enabled components to ease integration, setup, and use. Another trend we've heard about um, is, you know, the potential need to reconfigure packaging lines to adjust packaging for inflation, which some may call shrinkflation. Um, and consequently, that has, there's a need for versatile systems that can be reconfigured for smaller volume packages which is much easier than building in a new, a new packaging line. So as, as packaging equipment designers and developers seek to help their customers keep up with or stay ahead of these trends, um, they're looking for components and assemblies that can support automation, precision, industrial internet of things, and more advanced functions. So I'm really pleased to welcome our two speakers today who are helping packaging equipment develop, developers address these trends. These are our speakers today again are Prab Gorashankaran of Performance Motion Devices and Kenny Kowalchuk of Encoder Products. I'd like to welcome them now so they can share a little bit about the components they offer. And then afterward, we'll all discuss how to address some of these trends. Um, finally, to our audience, we'd love to have you join our conversation by sending in questions using the Q&A tab. So for now, I'd like to welcome Prab. 
Thank you, Daphne, for uh, background on the packaging space. Uh, PMD, uh, just a quick overview. We, we are a motion control provider. Uh, you'll see it a little bit later. We provide chips and drives and amplifiers and cards uh, to solve advanced motion control needs. Um, so we play a big part in some of the automation that's happening in the packaging industry. So just a few tips that we've seen uh, from inbound requests from customers in the packaging space typically have been, they require advanced motion uh, control requirements, uh, such as path planning and profiles to kind of coordinate, like uh, Daphne had mentioned, coordinate different axes and coordinate motion across uh, a picking robot and a conveyor uh, and things like that. And so they tend to use uh, these motion profiles, which help them kind of, it's as if you're drawing out what the motion would look like. You give it a start point and an end point and kind of give what the trajectory would look like and what the profiles in terms of acceleration, deceleration, uh, lots of different parameters um, related to the motion. And to achieve all this, they tend to use more of the advanced features that we provide, such as FOC and current control for pretty, very precise motion. Um, they want a smooth, quiet motion. So that's those are the trends we see on the packaging side. In terms of the control architecture, um, like Daphne was mentioning, there are a couple of different ways to approach it. One is the centralized, like if you look at a large uh, a picking robot, uh, as shown in the bottom picture there, it's kind of a centralized where there's a controller um, and all the axes are controlled by the central control box. A newer trend we're starting to see is more distributed controls like mobile robotics and a few other, um, even in packaging, where you kind of have a, a motion controller per axis. So that way the controls are right next to the axis, the controls, the encoder, the motor. And so the wiring that goes across is just power and the communications. And there's a distributed control architecture where each, each node is controlling their own motor and encoder. And the other key point that we keep getting constantly is this build versus buy is it all comes down to volumes is, okay, do you want to buy a, a subsystem or like a buy, uh, in our case, it would be buying a motion control board, which is already laid out and just wire into it um, or a plug and play cable connected drive versus making your own custom um, card with, uh, with our ICs or our digital drives. It typically tends to boil down to volume. If you have greater than maybe 500 to 1,000 pieces of that equipment, then they tend to go with the buy, uh, uh, the build side. This is if it's a little bit lower volume, then they go with the, the buy. It also boils down to the overall cost of the machinery. Um, sometimes time to market is key. So they tend to go with uh, buying it direct. We've also seen customers where they use a hybrid. They would buy the motion card or the cable connected drive, get their prototype up and running, um, and in parallel design their own card. So that way they can get time to market quicker. The, the first 50 to 100 prototypes are using the cards or the cable connected drives they bought, but in parallel they're designing their own uh, motion control system with our ICs or digital drives. So we see that a lot where they are able to get their software up and running quicker with buying the, the cards and the drives, and then later on building their own custom card. And obviously Kenny would talk after this about encoders, but encoders and sensors uh, play a key role here in terms of the type of encoders they want to use. And in some cases, like Daphne had mentioned, there's more advanced sensors, machine vision, and proximity sensors and limit switches and stuff for, especially in conveyors to detect packages and there's other sensors for barcoding and stuff. So we tend to be able to integrate with some of those with digital IOs. So this is just a quick overview of what we're seeing in terms of requirements for motion control on the packaging side. Uh, with that, I would just like to highlight, this is a pretty common uh, single axis IC. Uh, two of our largest packaging customers use this IC for uh, their own custom build, where they built a board 
So the capabilities that they tend to use, like we talked about before, is S-curve and trapezoidal profiles and electronic gearing to try and control remote axes linked with the local axis. And they tend to use a ton of uh, advanced features, like the programmable bi-quad filters and advanced PID filtering. Uh, there's also some customers that uh, look for custom a compensation in the motion to take out non-linearities in the mechanical design. So this picture on the right kind of gives you a high-level view of what the 58113 IC does. So it has, um, uh, you could build an uh, use an Atlas amplifier that we provide or build your own amplifier and you do the current control on the IC. And obviously the encoders that hook up, we get the position uh, data back from the encoders or from all sensors. So this is a pretty popular IC for a custom build. The other trend uh, we are starting to see is this newer, uh, it's a PCB mountable digital drive. So this kind of gives you the benefit of making your own custom uh, solution, but the card that you're building is a simple two layer card where you're just taking all the electronics and sophistication are in, built into the drive. Um, it has solderable power pins and uh, signal pins and you just solder this onto your board. And this is where we're starting to see more of the distributed architecture. Like this diagram shows here, they have a master that talks to their system host or ethernet or serial or CAN. And then there's an expansion network on the backside to control the remote axes. So from a customer end user point of view, it looks like a single three or four axis machine with the master is the only one that they talk to. And then the remote axes are controlled by the other drives. And there's a lot of uh, unique capability in this drive where it gets you up to one kilowatt of power. And there's a CPU on board, we call it the C-Motion engine, where we provide the user the capability to program uh, like a protocol translator or some synchronization logic, um, writing their own code that lives on the drive. Um, that way they can kind of distribute some of the control stuff. So the commands that are going are higher level commands uh, for motion. And the local drive does all the synchronization and kind of controlling the end motor. And it supports a wide range of uh, motors from DC brushes to brushed and step motors. And uh, it again, we talked about either you can have a centralized architecture, it supports that, or you could have a distributed architecture. So these are the two, uh, the IC and this PCB mountable digital drives, the two that we see most commonly used in the packaging world. Uh, most of our customers end up using one of these two solutions. Just to give you an idea of scale, I'm an engineer for background, so I just want to give you a visual uh, image, gives you an idea of the size of these things. So this actually shows a robotic arm with the distributed architecture, and this is uh, the digital drive. So as you see, it's a passive car. It just has capacitors and the connectors specific to the motors. So you have the digital drive uh, soldered onto one side. So each of these, there's a card per axis, we're living right at the border. And then you can actually connect them up and synchronize. There's a capability to synchronize these drives. So you get synchronized uh, multi-axis motion. So this is one example for you to take a look at. The other one, which is similar to a lot of the conveyor and other designs where they would have a, a common card and they would put all the drives that are um, controlling each of these axes on the common card. And this is showing a three axis uh, gantry. In this particular case, it's controlling the X, Y, and Z. And all the wiring comes back to the central card. So this just shows you the scale compared to the gantry size, the size of the car and the drive is pretty small. Um, so this is just to give you a quick flavor of what, what we're seeing in the packaging industry and a couple of examples of an actual design and how they look like. With that, I'll hand it over to Kenny uh, to walk us through the encoder side of things. Thank you, Prob, for all the insight on the ICs and the PCBs that um, PMD offers and kind of what you're seeing in the packaging industry on your side, which is uh, the devices that um, 
communicate with what we sell with the uh, Encoder Products Company. Um, hi, everyone. Appreciate you joining us today. I know we have a wide variety of folks from different industries signed in and probably with some different goals of what you hope to gain from this webinar. Um, there are countless unique needs and wants in the packaging world. So whether you're wanting a machine to build boxes or maybe you're implementing a new labeling system on your product and you want to integrate all that with a palletizing machine that you already use, um, it's very common to find an encoder involved in these processes. You know, you're looking to change or have a machine complete for you. Um, I wanted to start by explaining what encoders are and how they work. I know that there's some folks here that are probably very familiar with encoders and have worked with them extensively and maybe some that have never seen one before. So um, I'm just going to start with a brief introduction on encoders and how they can help packaging machinery systems. Um, so we're going to start with the most commonly found encoders in the packaging industry and kind of where they live. Um, so starting on this slide, um, our first model here is uh, a true track, a wheeled encoder um, model, which is really straightforward in the contact with a service. Uh, you can find them on belts, um, but it's kind of an all-in-one uh, package solution. Uh, we have a standard shafted encoder. They can be housed in many different places, um, just a good connection point whenever they're shafted and multiple different sizes and um, just, again, mechanical packages. Uh, stainless steel, um, I kind of put that as a placeholder for robust encoders. You know, if you're in the food and beverage industry, um, stainless steel and wash down is really important for um, packaging. You know, if you have some sort of spill or a break, uh, being able to withstand uh, liquids, kind of important. And then finally is a generic type of encoder is that we have a hollow bore um, encoder. And we find these a lot of times on motors and, um, you know, anytime there's an exposed shaft where you need to track rotation, um, this is uh, really where you see these. So, I mean, really you could break this down into three separate categories, a wheeled encoder, a shafted encoder, and a hollow bore encoder. And those are the most common uh, types of encoders um, that are in the packaging industry. Um, a little bit of breakdown of how encoders work. So um, at EPC and what's found typically in the packaging industry is optical encoders. So there's some housing um, kind of going from left to right on the diagram. Um, we There's housing that um, has a light source, which is typically an LED um, and a code disc. And the code disc dictates the uh, counts per revolution of the encoder. And the LED shines through this disc and it's picked up by a photo sensor. Um, and the photo sensor turns the signal from the LED pulse going in and out, like between spokes on a wheel, um, and turns that into a signal for um, you know a system to be able to read um, where the encoder is and its rotation. Uh, and a lot of these um, encoders, you know, they have different designs, but uh, optical is kind of the most common due to its ability to, um, you know, have high CPR counts and be able to have a blend of both speed and accuracy, which is something that um, can change based on uh, where the encoder ends up in the process. Um, which leads me to my next selection. So here is a really large, you know, outline of kind of start to finish of a typical packaging, labeling, shipping process. And I mean, there's really spots for encoders all along this journey here. Um, you know, we have a lot of different models that have sort of a, a unique feature offered with them or that really fit a specific need. So um, just to start kind of moving left to right, you know, our through bore encoders or our shafted encoders going on belt drive systems or anything that you know could get wet, stainless steel, IP69K, uh, we have some options for that. Um, there's also, um, I, did mention, I did mention earlier, most of the encoders are optical, but we do have some small magnetic-based encoders that use you know, hall sensors. Um, and yeah, there's, there's tons of different spots where they can be found in different types of machinery. Um, most of the time, the machine builders that design each step of this overall process uh, can be different, but 
they all need something that's reliable, durable, and it fits exactly what they need as far as uh, you know accuracy and speed. Um, we do custom encoder work. So if you have a problem where you're saying, hey, I need this kind of resolution or I need it to fit within a certain mechanical space, um, we specialize in being able to uh, work with customers on that and say, okay, well, here's what we can offer. And um, when we can get it basically at your door, um, we work with companies all over the world. Um, I just got done helping a company that's a box. It, they make machines that build boxes and they're based out of Italy. Um, so, you know, how to get up kind of early for that call, but there's lots of uh, potential for utilizing encoders across processes um, in the packaging industry. So, um, yeah. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it back to uh, Daphne and uh, let her continue on. Great. Thank you, Kenny. And um, thank you, Prav, very much as well. I, I really do appreciate each of you sharing, um, you know, what you're working on and, and what you can offer packaging equipment designers. Um, so I, I do have a few questions of my own for you um, both. Um, I do want to invite our audience to pose your own questions and be sure to type those into our Q&A box on screen. And we'll definitely try to get to your questions um, during our webinar. So um, to start, each of you mentioned a little bit about, you know, you're seeing um, increasing trends toward automation. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if there's anything you can, you know, expand upon that point on, on how each of you can help equipment designers support these trends toward automation. Yeah, I could, uh, this is a uh, prop with PMD. Uh, I could start. Yeah, we, we get a lot of inbound requests. There's a lot of uh, requests for smart conveyors. There's a uh, coordination like you talked about between a conveyor and a pick and place or a robot that's palletizing or sealing. There's a lot of unique requirements. Um, so we tend to approach it as a system design with the end customer. Uh, we kind of walk through the block diagram with them, what they're trying to accomplish and um, try and recommend the right uh, control or drive product for them. We provide a broad range so they can easily evaluate, try and prototype on the desk with a card that they buy, like a four axis card and simulate the type of controls that they would implement. And that lets them visualize how they would actually coordinate the motion and then design their own for uh, their uh, controls. We also have seen a lot of collaboration where they would take our standard DK, evaluate the controls that we provide and come back with either custom requirements in terms of uh, profiles or compensations that they need, uh, that they want us to implement in our controller. So we do provide custom firmware. So we work with the customer, try to figure out what they're trying to do and uh, in a lot of cases, they have very, very unique requirements for synchronization or coordinated motion. And we are able to implement them and down, provide them a custom version of our ICs. So it's a pretty collaborative approach, uh, especially with the packaging suppliers. Okay, excellent. Kenny, yeah, do you have I anything to add about yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, innovation is, it's it's hot right now in the packaging industry, um, you know, moving towards greater automation. Um, I think the most important thing that we've really been focusing on with designers is um, figuring about how we can deliver product to um, our customers and not just like any product, but the product that they need. And if it's unique, being flexible and basically meeting uh, the customer where they're at. Um, I think internally, you know, we ask ourselves, what can we do differently to better support our customers? And in this case of the question, the designers, um, a lot of times there needs to be, you know, quick, uh, responsive communication. Designers need solutions to test and then turn around and if a solution works, um, it's often that, uh, you know, a, a factory or a, a warehouse um, that's being scaled or built uh, quickly, uh, they need to know that whatever components that they've selected for their machine are 
exactly um, ideal for what they're trying to accomplish and that um, the components will be available and really just delivered on time when they need it. And so really our focus is on being secure in our process as well of our supply chains and um, making sure that we just deliver on our promises because I think in this day and age, the best way to support innovation is um, delivering results when you say you will. And that's something that um, is really um, kind of jet our opportunities forward. It's just being able to say yes for to questions like, can you do this and can you have it by this date, which has been awesome. So, Well, that's great news. Um, that support, I'm sure, is definitely appreciated. Um, I've, I've heard each of you talk a little bit about, you know, movement or positioning, you know, maybe becoming more precise on packaging lines. Um, can can each of you speak a little bit to that trend and if there's anything, you know, any specific um, solutions you can offer to help with achieving greater precision? Yeah, on the PMD side, so we work, I'm sure Kenny is the same, we work with a broad range of industries, right? So. We work from like a, a microscope stage that's in micron precision um, all the way down to just velocity control of uh, palms for uh, uh, dialysis machines and stuff like that. So we have a, a broad range of products. And so we are able to kind of learn from the high precision motion that happens in medical and apply some of that to the packaging side. Obviously cost is a, is a part of the equation but we are able to take some of the custom firmware features and implement them. Um, one of the examples was these custom profiles where they have breakpoints, they would program a path and at certain points in the path, they would trigger breakpoints and that would make them either add some compensation. So there's unique stuff that we could do in firmware that would provide them with more uh, precise motion for their specific machine. It's all tailored to the machine that they're building. So we're able to borrow some of the technology that we've developed for super high precision medical applications and apply it to the packaging space. Excellent. Yeah, I think my, my answer is very similar. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of different industries and everything from semiconductor manufacturing to, um, you know, packaging and labeling. And uh, really in the world of encoders, um, you know, we, we have encoders that are on satellites that are positioned in deep space, but they don't have to move very quickly um, when they're finding that precise, um, you know, spot and motion calculation. So uh, the blend between being precise and fast is um, a challenge. And that's something that we're, our product base really tries to um, meet that versatility. Um, some applications you don't have to compromise and some others that you do, um, you know, robotics isn't getting slower. Uh, it is getting faster. So staying on top of the expectations for speed and the speed of that communication um, is something that we actively work on, you know, with our communication protocols and um, updating our product to meet that demand. Um, and I think, yeah, I don't see any slowdown in the future. I think, the best you can do is just stick with, um, you know, whoever is asking for the latest and greatest and seeing if you can meet that need. So that's something that we are always actively looking at. Okay. Great. Great. Um, regarding um, the increased interest in machine vision systems and sensors, which, you know, kind of feeds into um you know, data collection um, and, you know, the industrial internet of things. Um, how are you each, you know, helping to play a role in supporting vision and um, sensors on packaging lines? Yeah, in our case, the, so that we have our ICs or drives that are, have connectivity to encoders, both uh, relative and absolute encoders, and we support a bunch of different interfaces like SSI and BIS and sine cosine and stuff for all different encoder types. And then we we provide uh, eight, seven or eight digital I/O that the user can interface to simple sensors. 
for more advanced vision stuff, what we've seen typically is their host processor has the machine vision data coming back because they have to run an algorithm on the, the images that they're collecting, post-process them, and use that, for example, in the packaging line, right? They're scanning a barcode as the package is process, crossing across, and they have a go, no go kind of stuff to push the package aside or not. Those are type of algorithms that are run on their host processor. So in, in a system design case, they would have the host processor take in the machine vision data, uh, interpret it, then program a profile onto our drives or one of the host interfaces we provide, like CAN or SPI or Ethernet. So typically that ends up happening in the customer's host processor side um, on the machine vision side. Then to your point, we're starting to see more and more machine vision getting used. There's also a whole uh, line of optical encoders and limit switches and stuff like that, like Kenny had talked about, which also get used in conveyors, where this, it's not true machine vision in the sense of actual imaging, but the optical sensors are picking up proximity and providing feedback to the drives to say when to stop or go and stuff like that. Yeah, just to jump off of what um, Prab was saying is that, yeah, in our world, the encoders are really doing, it's a handshake between the vision systems and the conveyance and the product um, being moved. Um, there's been huge advancements in camera and vision systems over the last, you know, five to 10 years. And, but they're typically coupled with, you know, a moving belt system or they need some sort of synchronization. Um, and that's really where, you know, um, our systems come into play and being able to, um, yeah, have the versatility of working with whatever confines uh, shows up. Um, I think, you know, a lot of that comes down to, as Prob mentioned, communication protocol, um, you know, is, you know, CAN bus and um, EtherCAT that's pretty common in the industry. And we're seeing a rise in interest in these communication protocols so that they can talk between, um, you know, advanced vision systems, whether it's, you know, a camera system or LIDAR or anything of the sort. So. Are, are there any challenges, um, you know, with um, handling all those different communication protocols? Yeah, I think there are some standards, but there are not as many. They are all unique to the machine design. Um, so we tend to stay with the standard interface like Ethernet or SPI. So we, we provide the, the framework for them to implement a higher level protocol. PMD has uh, a motion, uh, the UC motion. We, all our motion code is written in C. And we provide a reference protocol that's there that they can command axes and stuff. Um, so it all it ends up depending on the the design that they are actually implementing. We've seen CAN used a lot. We we've, uh, we've seen Ethernet and CDL. So it's, it all depends on the end machine designer as to what their preferred methodology is. Okay. Yeah, from the encoder um, standpoint, we. You know, we just are trying to meet um, every communication protocol that's out there because, yep, it comes out of the machine design and the industry and um, being able to, to to work with those systems. So, okay, excellent. So, so we're kind of in the data age these days, right? And everyone talks about data collection and um, machines are becoming more intelligent and you know generating data. Um, are, are either of you, you know, in your your system um, involved in either generating data or collecting data, or um, or how do you? Is there a need for you to support that in any new ways? Yeah, in our um, so drives, we provide this trace capability where it's it's like you can pick the variables that you want to monitor. So, for example, you can actually uh, look at the current. Uh, for certain axes, you can look at a few different parameters, right? You can trace it and collect data over time. And uh, you can kind of do predictive maintenance at the machine level. They can kind of see, map a trend of what a good machine when it's working looks like, 
and see if there's any trend to any change in data. So we had a few customers that uh, collect trace. What we do is we trace the variable stored in memory and then the host processor can fetch that data and kind of do post-processing and analysis on their side. So we've seen that used in predictive maintenance and other applications where the user writes code to kind of take that data, either process it on the host or ship the data out to the cloud or wherever for analysis. And then they can then run some sort of predictive maintenance analytics kind of software on it to say, does the data showing any changes? Um, so we started to see people collecting data that way because the drives stay right next to the motor and uh, you can kind of have um, a feel for when like the bearings are going and things like that, right? When there's a maintenance uh, event required. So we see that happening. We also see uh, data collection for uh, advanced motion in the sense, based on the data they collect, they try to compensate intelligently. Uh, so this, we see both, uh, some of it is data being collected and shipped off offline for analysis. And some of it is they use the data collected to in system kind of adjust uh, the motion algorithm. So we see both scenarios being used. Okay. I think um, in our world, you know, we really are a sensor that is a, data collection point, right? Um, and encoders is really, you know, the positioning feedback as far as um, being able to communicate with the controlling devices. Um, it comes down to the communication protocols, right? Can we feed that data that eventually can be saved or analyzed, um, which we're kind of on top of, but there's other features that are kind of discussed in the industry, um, such as, you know, temperature, um, evaluation and we haven't really seen that at least in our world um, in the motion control uh, kickoff just yet um, because it typically comes with an increased cost um, and it, customers aren't really interested it, in it enough where they can justify you know that increase of cost for what they see as not extremely relevant data but I think the overall information, um, being logged and saved um, in control systems definitely uh, for preventative maintenance um, has potential. So, um, yeah, for us, really just boils down to uh, how we communicate. Okay, excellent. Um, one one micro trend that we've heard um, is that, that you know there may be some interest in reducing the size of machinery, which, you know, could create demand for small footprint packaging machines and lines. Um, are either of you seeing a need, you know, to reduce the size of machinery and therefore that might impact what um, each of you offer? Yeah, like the case in point, right? In our case, we had this ion cable connector drive, the, which did up to 500 watts of power. The newest uh, solderable and uh, N series drive is is a fraction of the size, so it's only 37 by 37 millimeter, and it does a kilowatt. So we are able to leverage all the developments, right, with newer ICs and higher performance, just to shrink the overall footprint uh, and actually offer more features in the smaller footprint. And because we're trying to do genetic products that go into lots of different industries. Uh, so in the medical space, there's a lot of push to miniaturization, uh, like hand tools and stuff like that. So we're starting to see it in the packaging uh, space too. It comes down to power also, right? So as you get smaller, you're more power efficient, right, by design. So there's a it's kind of goes hand in hand. There's like a size, weight, and power kind of dynamic that goes together. And we see that a lot in lots of industries. And I think the packaging side is also getting there. And you're starting to see more and more collaborative robots and smaller robots uh, that are operating that are very size uh, uh, specific. Um, and those are getting used more and more in the packaging industry. So the size is becoming a key factor in some of the design decisions.
Yes, I think uh, what you said there is pretty much dead on. You look at industries and things like the medical world really are particular, you know, in their spacing and their precision, and they want something compact. And then that eventually finds its way across all industries. Um, and whether it starts there or, you know, semiconductor, it kind of moves around. Um, in our world of encoders, um, you know, I think I've never met with a customer that says, I need a bigger, slower, responsive <laughs> encoder. Um, so everybody's focused on their, you know, their footprint, you know, smaller operation, you know, if you can make a machine that can complete a task in half the space, well, then you can have two machines and double your output, right? So it's it's funny when that's said, because really, it comes down to a lot of component size, right? So if you can create smaller components that have just as, same, you know, the same amount of features that you're looking for, um, at a competitive price point, um, then it's a lot of times a no brainer for machine builders. And we are seeing that, um, you know, as companies have to uh, ramp up production to meet, um, you know, rates. And I think the packaging industry is it grows in different sectors. Um, companies that used to maybe build boxes by hand or have somebody put labels on, they're having to now, um, have a machine that does it and they need two instead of one uh, to, with their new demand, so. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, like, that you kind of raise a question about like what other new shifts we may see in the market. Are there um, any other predictions about what next generation packaging machines, you know, could be expected to do? And, and are you, you know, preparing for some of these changes? Yeah, there's a lot of um, requirements for coordination and synchronization across machines. Before there was a smart conveyor, there was a pick and place robot they, that operated independently, uh, but there's more and more coordinated motion uh, that we're seeing in a lot of these cases. And there's more automation, in, even in the conveyor lines and the pick and place stuff is where they hand off after a certain motion on one, they hand off to, uh, trigger something else on the other piece of equipment to do motion. So we're starting to see more sophisticated motion uh, in terms of coordination, in terms of the details of the profile um, and the paths that they plan to traverse uh, as part of their motion. So we're starting to see more sophisticated motion um, get into uh, packaging as well. Yeah, Prob is Right on the money there. I think, um, you know, more I, I, more efficient uh, motion is definitely talked about and the integration of separate uh, systems as well, right? Whether, you know, you might have a conveyance system and then a robotic pick and play system that are designed separately or that they are just two processes that have never met. Um, and now with this move towards precise motion, um, you can now integrate these systems um, to a much larger extent than before uh, because of, you know, yeah, precision and reliability. So we uh, are definitely seeing that um, kind of, I think, you know, in the future as far as combining that with smaller footprint and um, integration. Okay, okay excellent. Well, I want to be sure to get to some of our audience's questions. Um, so I thought I might take a few of those now. Um, and just as a reminder to our audience, if you do have a question, please enter it in our Q&A box um, and hit submit. And uh, if we don't get to your questions, though, today, um, we will be able to follow up afterward. Um, so, um, Prop, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned, um, you know, making the build versus buy decision. Um, when in the design process should a equipment designer make that decision? Yeah, typically what we've seen is they start with the buy where they buy the card for evaluation and prototype. And uh, as, because early on, if you look at the life cycle, they have an idea for a packaging machine so they want to prototype it with the motors and the encoders they plan to use on the bench. And then the mechanical designers come into play 
in terms of what the final machine would look like and what space they allocate for the motion control part of it. So uh, what we've seen is at that point, they kind of decide, okay, would the buy the card that they bought, would it fit in that space or would they have to build a custom card? The other decision tree that we see is the volumes. If they were based on their marketing and product management marketing, they decide if, is it gonna be more than 500 pieces? Then they would say, okay, it's worth the effort. They kind of do an analysis to say, is it worth the effort and time to build a custom card, right? Using the ICs. So that's the branch point um, where they kind of see in terms of mechanical design, is there a space constraint? Or if in terms of volume, is there a price point that they want to hit? So that's when we've typically seen people do the build versus buy. But most people tend to start with our cards to just get used to the PMD uh, C programming and the controls and be able to prototype and do a proof of concept to make sure that they can achieve the level of precision that they want. And probably a little bit later down the line, they make the build versus buy a decision. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Kenny, um, what are the max and minimum speeds a linear encoder can detect? That's a great question. Um, we really don't make linear encoders at uh, EPC, we specialize in rotary encoders, but um, there's a few different designs um, when it comes to linear encoders. Most of them use uh, basically like a magnetic strip um, and the communication between a, a linear system like that versus a um, rotary um, optical encoder, it, it's much, it's much slower. I don't know the exact, you know, numbers off the top of my head, but you will get a much faster response from a optical um, encoder versus a magnetic encoder. Um, so if you're worried about um, speed of communication and signal, uh, optical is definitely the route you want to go. Um, we do have it when it comes to linear motion, well, I, I call it a tape measure, but it's basically uh, a rotary encoder hooked up to a constantly uh, tensioned spring in a cable that extends out, and that just translates uh, the linear motion into um, a rotational uh, motion. And that's um, something that is used, um, you know, if something has to move, very, you know, as a, like a gantry or something very rapidly. But um, yeah, optical much faster than linear. Magnetic. Okay, thank you. Um, do you make custom encoders? Uh, we do. We have, um, you know, engineering engineering team in house. We do custom applications all the time. Um, if there's something particular, whether it's mechanical package or um, communication, you know, protocol or anything that you're looking for specifically, we have a team that will answer the phone and tell you um, if we can do it. Okay, great. Um, and um, what's the most compact encoder solution um, for packaging machinery? Compact solution is um, actually a, it's a magnetic uh, solution. Uh, it's not, not optical uh, because it's, it's very, very small. It's about the size of, um, it's smaller than a quarter um, as far as roundness. And uh, it, yeah, it uses hall sensors and a magnet, uh, but the, you know, it's not super fast um, as far as response time. However, it's super durable. Um, you know, it's IP69K, we call it our 30M, and it's a lot of times on the back of uh, motors, um, smaller motors, that's where it fits. Um, and that would be, uh, that's our smallest package. Okay, okay excellent, thank you. Um, Prob, I have a question for you and, and maybe Kenny. Um, uh, can you synchronize motion across multiple axes or axes? Yeah, we do uh, all the time. So we have we have uh, all our drives and ICs have a sync signal. So what they end up, just diving a little bit deeper, what they end up doing is the master generates a, a sync pulse that goes out as an input to the slaves. And what that does is it kind of coordinates all the PID loops and control loops are all in sync. So um, 
any axis motion that happens in one is all time stamped and synchronized on the other axis. So uh, it's it's in step. We see that a lot uh, being used in uh, multi-axis machines. And even the example that I showed with the N-ion where you have the, the distributed architecture, where you have a master and then the slaves on an expansion network, you can synchronize all of them. So it looks like there's very coordinated motion, especially they want to uh, synchronize when one axis ends, like a conveyor, stops at a certain spot, they want to trigger the next guy to move. And so there they use sync a lot to kind of synchronize axis, uh, motion across axis. Okay. Kenny, is that anything that encoders help with? Like motion on multiple axes? Uh, they, they can. Um, you know, we it, you would need multiple encoders. You know, they, they can't, uh, I guess, watch uh, multiple axes at once. But yeah, I, I guess it kind of depends on your machine and your design. Um, they really can do, you know, they can do bi-directional. So encoders can go just, you know, one direction count, um, or they can know their exact positioning if you go with an absolute encoder. Um, so yeah, I, I, it, I guess the broad answer would be, it depends <laughs> kind of, um, yeah, where, where you're positioning the encoder and what you need to track. Yeah, and actually uh, to piggyback on Kenny's, we've seen cases where if it's a, a super high safety requirement, they may put a dual encoder on one axis. We've seen that where they would have a main encoder controlling uh, the motion of the axis, but then let's say it's linked mechanically to some other through a belt or something, they would put a second encoder at the, uh, at the end position and use that as a safety. So if for some reason these two encoders don't match, then they know something has happened in the mechanical system and to shut down the system. So we've seen cases where we do support dual encoder on a single axis for safety and camming and other functionality. Yes, we, we have seen an increase, especially for those uh, sorts of systems and like the, um, not directly in the packaging industry, but the AGV market, um, you know, encoders on a single axis or point where they have different communication protocols or types of, um, you know, uh, data collection, just because that, you know, they want redundancy for safety, um, like Prop was saying. And that's definitely been increasing, I think, as humans and automated machines um, interact more and more, just having those uh, fail safes in place. Okay. Okay. Thank you both. Um, Prab, I believe this is a question for you because I think I heard you mention it. Um, do you support path planning um, at all? And maybe yeah, any do, other uh, custom motion? Yeah, yeah. So what the what it looks like is we the feature we call it is a user defined profile mode. So the customer can actually load a table of points. So what it is is it's a whole series of points that we have to move. And for each point, they associate a profile and a bunch of capabilities for that point-to-point -point move. So it's a whole series of point-to-point -point moves, and that's the path that we plan. And we've also seen cases in the medical world where they'll have two paths, one as they traverse, one as at a certain decision point, they would decide if they want to continue on that path or switch over to an alternate path. Um, so we've seen some customers do that also. So. We do support it. It's it's almost it's like a table driven. So you load a whole series of points and profiles and details for the moves into a table, and then we traverse that path. So we provide uh, path planning. It's used a lot in medical. We're starting to see it used in packaging too. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, is that anything that encoders would um, help with, Kenny? Uh, not really, to be honest. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Um, okay. And I have a question here about um, can, uh, you know, potential users purchase your products for testing? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, yeah. 
Go ahead, Prop. You can go first. Yeah, yeah. So they, we see that a lot. Like we sell through uh, Mauser. So we see a lot of one, two unit purchases. It could be a university or it could be someone kind of trying to prototype an idea. So we see that a lot for, um, and there are robots that are designed just for testing. If it's testing automation, we see a lot of use cases where our uh, controls and drives are used for testing automation. Okay. Yeah, we, we will definitely um, help a customer out. We try to keep what we a stock of demo units in-house that we'll happily send out, let somebody try out to make sure it's something that they need and see what they like and don't like about it. And we do try to uh, communicate to our customers that if they decide they know what they need and it's they don't need um, a large bulk order uh, right out the door, um, we do offer expedites. So if you just need, you know, five encoders, a lot of times we can have them out within two days, um, which is pretty great when it comes to, you know, machine design and testing and integration. Because sometimes um, you need more than, you know, just one test unit for your system to work. So we're pretty flexible with customers when it comes to testing. And um, I know Prob mentioned students. Um, yeah, we work with a lot of colleges and robotics programs and things and give them, you know, special deals. So something we see often. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you both very much. I, I really do appreciate you um, each sharing your offerings, um, enter entertaining my questions and answering some audience questions. I really do appreciate Rob um, and Kenny, your efforts today. Thank you. Thank you, um, Daphne. Yeah, thank you for hosting, Daphne. Appreciate, um, yeah, hosting all this and putting it all together for the audience and um, hope they gain something from it. Thank you. Um, and definitely want to thank our sponsors today, um, Performance Motion Devices, Harvalux, Encoder Products Company, and Automation Direct. Thank you very much. Um, and definitely want to thank our audience. We, we do appreciate your attention and your participation today. Within the next 24 hours, um, everyone will be receiving a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to the event today. Our webinar is copyright 2022 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned and copyrighted by Informa Markets, and the inv individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, Prob and Kenny, I'm Daphne Allen. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day, everyone.